Good evening again, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this very important discussion about spike detox. Let me be clear. There are many people who believe that this is just a gimmick, a misinformation concept that people are using to lure um, vulnerable people into paying for supplements and the like. Well, I've now taken a relatively deep dive looking at this concept about the spike detox. And what I'll be presenting to the people who are registered for the webinar is that I'll be sharing with them the insights that I've come up with through the research, looking at the things that are out there, asking the questions, reflecting on the science that I've been looking at for a number of years and seeing how it all integrates together. So, Let's get started with regards to the presentation. As I said, if you are on YouTube, you will see the first part of the presentation, but the rest of it will only be for the registrants of the webinar. And, um, and if you want access to it afterwards, you'd have to um, join on a website or something. So we'll share more information about that. But let's get started with the full presentation here about the concept of spike detox. Does everyone need one? So the spike detox is an important concept. And the question is, if you are experiencing symptoms like fatigue, brain fog, cardiovascular issues that aren't random, could they be linked to a hidden factor? What if your body is still reacting to spike protein long after exposure? This is a really, really important question because fundamentally anyone who is doing research around COVID and long COVID, say for instance, recognizes that there seems to be a direct correlation between spike protein presence and symptoms. The question is, is it connected with most other symptoms that people are having? And that's where that concept and that idea of a spike detox comes from. Because if it's still there and causing symptoms, how do you get rid of it? And that's where the complexities of the science come in. And that's where we really have to be creative in finding solutions. As usual, when I start discussing any of these points, this is for information. This is my own research some of my ideas, and it should never replace you going to your doctor or your emergency department if you are unwell. So let's get started again. Here are the main things that I hope that the people who are on the webinar will understand by the end of this. Understanding the importance of spike persistence. Is there a link between spike protein and immune dysregulation? vascular and the inflammatory characteristics of the spike protein and strategies for detox and immune recovery. Those are the primary things that I want to focus on by the end of this presentation and hopefully make it clear to people who are listening. Out of this, I have come up with what I think is a probably clear scientific pattern. And what you will notice is that this root approach where I talk about getting to the root cause is not short. You can see by the time you reach T, you're beyond nine weeks. And one of the problems is, is that in reality, there is no easy way to resolve the spike protein issue. And so therefore, it's very important that when you're reflecting on strategies, you understand who is affected, why they're affected, and the complications or the complexities with getting rid of the spike protein. So that's part of the process that I'll come to later on, but let's get down to the basics. As usual, this is a coronavirus, human coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, a lovely diagram here. And usually on the surface of each virus, there are these spike proteins. And they're usually about 25 or so on the surface of each, um, each virus. Now, Look very carefully and you'll notice that there are three little circles in it. And that's because each spike protein is a trimer. Every one of these three can bind to ACE2 and get the spike protein inside the cell. 
And it's very complex the way how this operates in that they flip from a closed to an open position and they keep on doing that to evade the immune system. So it's a very sophisticated piece of kit that's attached to this virus. But once this virus binds primarily to ACE2, it can enter into a cell and it can replicate some more. And that's the essence of what happens with SARS-CoV-2. It may seem as though it's no big deal, as long as it stays in your upper airway and doesn't get into the systemic circulation. This is another image here of the spike protein. And again, you can see here that it has these three points on it, and each one can then bind to S2. And this is the S2 portion that sits in the in the envelope here um, for the virus sits in this part here and this is largely what was replicated when we um, created the vaccines slight adjustments with just two proline molecules in the mrna but certainly for the adenovirus and the others it was largely the same setup that they had as the virus and this is part of the question and one of the issues that we will have to think about and reflect on. Now, this spike protein, the point that I usually make about it is that it is extremely sticky. If you have ever played that game where you have the Velcro and the tennis ball, and you just have to let the ball hit the Velcro and it just sticks there, that is kind of like how in my mind I describe the spike protein. It sticks to lots of things. It's not easy to resolve, and that's an important point. It sticks to lots of proteins, and that's the characteristic that led me to recognize the autoimmune component, because if it sticks to normal proteins, it can trigger autoimmune responses from molecular mimicry. And this is just an example of what it could look like. And I've got here multiple proteins that are stuck onto the uh, spike protein. It, it just sticks to a lot of proteins. And as I said, this is why it is a problem. Now, some people think the virus is the problem. My view is that the virus is the problem because it gets spike protein into the systemic system. Fundamentally, the spike protein is the thing that largely binds to a lot of proteins and causes a lot of immune issues. And this is the point that I think really has to be grasped. Once it gets into the systemic circulation, it has far-reaching impacts. Now, a rat model was used in this study to emphasize that point. And here you have, this is about spike protein persistence in the skull and meninges and how it may contribute to the neurological sequelae of COVID-19. And what they did is they used the Wuhan spike. And you can see here, uh, it's lightly colored. That's because it was uh, an infection process. So it does spread around, not as much. Then you have influenza. And what you must notice with influenza is that it is primarily concentrated in the lungs. And that's what you expect with most respiratory viruses. But if you inject the spike protein into a mouse model, oh my goodness, it literally binds to every organ. And that is pretty serious. So the question then becomes, if we know that the spike protein can do this, how does the body get rid of it? That's really fundamentally the question that I'm talking about when it comes to this concept of the spike detox. And from a scientific point of view, whatever your persuasion, you have to acknowledge that the spike protein is really a problematic feature with this virus. And one of the hard questions that has to be worked out is where does it go? And how do we get rid of it? And to show you the extent of this, this is what it looks like. This is where we have found remnants of this spike protein and sometimes parts of the virus as well. In the circulatory system, plasma, platelets, 
the lymphatic system, the endothelial and vascular system, endothelial cells, small blood vessels, skin and muscle, organs, heart, liver, kidney, lungs, and especially Omicron has a target for the heart and critically immune cells. This is probably one of the most serious problems about the spike protein and remnants of this virus, immune cells. And the reason why it is so important is because most other cells will regenerate, but immune cells, they can literally live for a lifetime. If they do, what do you do if spike protein is stuck in them? How do you get rid of it? So when you think about, one of the questions that comes up is really, what is worse? Well, without getting us into too much trouble, you just have to remember that in both cases, it doesn't seem, it does matter to some extent where a spike comes from. But certainly, if you have an infective component that gets stuck, there is a possibility that it could last for longer. But based on the research, both of them can stick around for a long time. And there is certainly distribution, but certainly from the vaccine point of view, it tends to be primarily the lymphatic system, um, as opposed to it can be quite broad from the infection. And you can have very similar patterns of symptoms after both. So this issue with the spike protein, as I said, whatever your persuasion is still a problem. There's one more piece to this puzzle that very few people grasp, and it is an extremely important point. And it's to do with the fact that something interacts with bacteria. We don't know exactly what it is, but we know that when bacteria, certain bacteria, especially the Clostridia species, when it is exposed to some form of infection, um, nanoparticles, spike protein, it starts to produce bacterial toxins, and it seems to continue to produce spike protein. That bacteriophage property is probably one of the most serious aspects about spike detox, because your bacteria will just pass it from one to another. And this is probably why we see in the wastewater in some parts uh, of the US that continue to measure it, that we see that wastewater levels will never seem to go down because so many people may have a chronic infection in their gut that is connected with bacteria. This is extremely complex science and very, very challenging to figure out how to resolve. Fundamentally though, you just need to remember at the end of the day, if you can prevent the virus from getting beyond your mucosal immune system, that's the lining here, it's very sophisticated, very responsive, very effective. The challenge over the next number of years as COVID continues to circulate is whoever does a better job at preventing the virus from breaking through into the systemic circulation will have better health outcomes. That's the reality. And don't underestimate how effective mucosal immunity is. It is very sophisticated. As you can see, the virus has to pre, um, get past the barrier of mucus, then it has to get inside the cell. And even when it gets inside the cell and starts to replicate, it has to get past this immune defense where they will kill any cells that are infected. So an effective mucosal immune system is an extremely critical part of addressing any longer term issues with regards to SARS-CoV-2. The reality is that it's continuing to circulate. In theory, everyone is at risk, but some people are more at risk than others. That's the way that I look at it. And everyone needs to be vigilant to try and reduce their risk of exposure in the long run. Principle is, what if you could find out if spike protein is still circulating in your body? 
would you want to know? The reason I've asked that question is because very soon, because I have access to some of the points that are coming up, very soon there is likely to be something that can measure that and give an idea as to who still has circulating spike protein, because we need to understand that. We need to understand which symptoms are related, how are they connected. There's a lot of work to be done. If you want to follow along with these things, what you must do is look in the link in the description and you'll see a link to do a survey, the root program and the webinar application form. If you are on YouTube here, please click on that and it will then get some information. And please, when you reach down to the bottom and it talks about other information that's relevant, you can put your response here to say specifically you were interested in the spike protein so that I will know that that's something that you've been focused on. So we're going to continue this webinar in a short time with everyone else, but the takeaway point for those people who are on YouTube, this is a problem that doesn't seem as though it's going to go away. We need strategies to address prevention to reduce the risk of it getting inside the systemic system. And once it's there, we also need strategies to help the body to overcome removing it. So thank you for my YouTube audience and for my webinar registrants, please just stay with me for a few more minutes as we continue with the presentation.